Hello, and uh, welcome to uh, today's session on presentations that challenge the biomedical model. Uh, we're going to be talking about medically unexplained symptoms and uh, a whole lot more. Um, and I think uh, it would be worth highlighting from the beginning that this is a uh, multidisciplinary effort, including psychiatry, general practice, medicine, surgery, and health psychology. So you're going to get it from all sides today, and necessarily so, because this is an uh, intensely um, interdisciplinary area. Um, I'd like to start off with a bit of bad news. Being an academic, that comes naturally to me. Um, the bad news is that junior doctors are uh, confronted by this problem quite commonly and are generally unprepared to manage it. So a real call to arms to get ready for this as you approach your uh, TI and uh, house officer years. On the other hand, there is some good news, and that is that um, uh, clinical academics here and uh, in Britain have been working hard uh, to get a uh, set of guidelines together for how to approach this common patient group. And here's uh, one example that's in your essential reading list that I would uh, strongly commend to you. Uh, in terms of today's learning outcomes, we've got a few. And to just scan through this list, we're going to be focusing first on uh, medically unexplained symptoms and uh, basically how the biomedical model um, doesn't quite uh, fill the bill in terms of uh, understanding and dealing with those, but also going further after a few case discussions to consider other areas in which the uh, biomedical uh, notion of the world isn't quite fit for purpose, and these mainly revolve around the doctor-patient relationship. So we'll come back to uh, each of these points as we go. Let's first uh, launch into um, one of your clinical scenarios, which is that of uh, chest pain in a young woman. So imagine yourself uh, on a medicine attachment as a senior medical student or junior house officer, and you're thrown into the deep end when you're asked to uh, assess this individual. Um, as you read through the detail there, you'll realize that you are the latest in a long list of clinicians who uh, are vulnerable to defeat in the, in the presence of this uh, uh, person's clinical particulars. And you have to uh, really take a step back and think about, well, what's, what's uh, not worked in terms of her assessment and management so far? Um, important, I think, also to consider how you, as a junior doctor, might feel confronted by this and perhaps what other people are saying about uh, the patient and indeed about you being uh, pushed into the deep end to try to assess and manage the problem. You might ask yourself who ordered yet another chest x-ray. She's had many and they've all been normal. So you might consider a whole range of different diagnoses to explain this uh, puzzling presentation. Here are a few of them. And I'd invite you to just consider how much evidence you might have already um, assembled to support um, any one of these. And indeed, there will be others. So you need to think about, in the absence of a firm diagnosis, what's your interim management going to look like? And indeed, should you go down the road of so many of your predecessors and order more investigations? Um, there's a lot of things that could be done. She's not had an LP yet. Um, there's a possibility. Um, a total body scan, whatever that is, is perhaps uh, something that could be considered as an uh, investigation of last resort. Um, uh, our surgeon is going to be joining us shortly, might consider an a exploratory laparotomy. All sorts of interesting options there. Um, so I'd like you to think about what you might do 
and indeed whether you want any further physical investigations. On the other hand, if you took a step back, you might consider instead speaking to the patient and seeing, well, what's it like at her side? And there's all sorts of things that haven't been terribly well documented in the record. Um, and a few of them are listed here. So some additional background might be useful as well as I think crucially her version of events. What does she actually think is going on and why has nothing worked so far? Um, let's pause there for a moment and just see if any of our uh, clinical colleagues have any comments they'd like to make before we move on to the general topic of biomedicine. Uh, Bruce Arrell here, da uh, David. Um, yes, I think it's slightly tragic that she's ended up on an inpatient ward, costing many thousands of dollars a day for something that probably should have been dealt with a long way upstream. But this is not uncommon in this situation. Um, and clearly, your the chances of finding of a medically explained diagnosis is getting less and less likely. Yep, thanks, Bruce. Um, we have a uh, consultant physician with us as well who's often responsible for such uh, uh, inpatient um, medical teams. Tim, would you offer a comment? Um, yes, I agree with Bruce that um, it's a pity she got as far as the ward, because once you get as far as a ward, things happen. Um, and it's almost as if they've got their own momentum. And if, if A doesn't work out, then you do B, then you do C and D and so on. Um, I think it is very important to take a step back and do a thing that sometimes hospital doctors find very difficult, and that's just sit down and spend some time discussing exactly the questions you've got on the slide um, here. Um, and there can be difficult subjects for doctors to, to broach. Um, but, you know, I think we, all, and Natalie might be able to help, but how you do broach them. But um, I think if you, you know, the important thing would be, I think, talking in a non confrontational and, and very unjudgmental way would be the important things. Yep. Thanks, Tim. Nat Natalie, any comment on that? Um, I, I would agree with, with what everyone else has already said. And um, I suppose the best way to open up that dialogue with patients is to sort of get their perspective of what's going on. So asking them what they think it is, is you a helpful opener? And, and they might say, I've got no idea. Um, and then from there, it can be useful looking at um, at things that they've been told or heard from others or what, what other people have suggested to them, just so that you're on the same page and you can sort of navigate your discussion from that point onwards. David, Bruce here. One thought I've got is that we, um, doctors tend to think once you've got the diagnosis, nothing else is needed. But in these situations, it's the patient's context. She's, uh, she's not her diagnosis in this case and we really need to know what's going on uh, in the wider part of her life. And as I get more into this sort of topic of interest, I realize uh, we need to look at more of that, that psychosocial environment that the patient is situated in, because that's probably going to be where the answer lies. So a good um, couple of uh, take home principles there in the discussion. I just add something, David, sorry. Yes, just, go ahead. Uh, in general, that the, the very busy ward round with consultant followed by 12 disciples of registrars and house officers and, and medical students is, is not the best forum for doing this. I think you need to sit down and spend some one-to-one -one time. Quite. And I think um, that issue you mentioned before about um, diagnostic or uh, investigational momentum, Tim, is going to be... Um, uh, revisited later in the presentation in a uh, couple of further cases. So we'll, we'll uh, come back to that. And let's move on now to just a general um, overview of biomedicine and 
its uh, uh, wonderful multifaceted features as well as some of its shortcomings. Uh, we've got to acknowledge that without biomedicine, um, we wouldn't be here and uh, uh, neither would our uh, audience of year five medical students. Um, but despite its obvious drawbacks, which we're gonna be highlighting in this session, uh, we also have to acknowledge that we adore biomedicine as a explanatory model. Uh, it has um, made such a difference to how human health and disease have been conceptualized and huge advances in healthcare and indeed longevity uh, around the world because of its um, advent and development over the past century. So let's uh, take it with a lump of salt and realize that it's an enormously powerful tool, but we have to be aware of its limitations in order to make best use of it. Amongst the problems of biomedicine, I'd like to highlight a couple of them. And one is really um, highlighted by that first case that we've just considered of the young woman with chest pain. A lot of symptoms that we encounter in clinical practice, and some might say, you know, uh, a majority of them in some settings don't have a definable pathology underlying them. And that makes it difficult for us because, of course, we want to find uh, ways to help people and relieve their symptom experience and associated impairments. But the problem is that very often uh, some of these uh, presentations look for all the world like a uh, an actual organic problem. So we are left with a tension in deciding whether or not to chase a biomedical explanation or whether to abandon that course of action and uh, think about uh, the wider context and perhaps talking to the patient. Um, the other problem is that just because someone might have a so-called functional disorder doesn't mean that they're not also entitled to have real organic pathology side by side with it. And so that's the added layer of complexity that we face, that people with bodies do get sick and do have uh, physical problems um, as they go through life. So we have to weigh up the possibility that at any given time, uh, there may be functional elements to a presentation. There may also be uh, pathological organic ones. And so the problem with over applying biomedicine to problems that aren't physical or aren't organic is that we end up um, making everyone a bit frustrated and upset. We also waste huge amounts of time and resources. And then there's also the question of iatrogenic harms, which can be surgical, they can be pharmacological, they can be psychological. And we'll come back to each of those later on. Um, the issue, of course, for us now, and indeed for um, all the year five students who are contemplating this conundrum, is why do we, as a profession, persist in chasing biomedical explanations when there are none? And there are a couple reasons why. Um, uh, perhaps this comment from a, um, uh, a rather foppish Frenchman, uh, otherwise known as Voltaire, uh, makes clear that we do have a all too human tendency of uh, what you might call um, confirmation bias. And we look for reasons to continue uh, to believe what we start believing, and we see that, of course, in many spheres of our lives, including um, uh, contemporary politics, apart from uh, many others. So we just need to be aware of the tendency for people to um, chase up what they know and to continue to seek uh, reinforcement or evidence around what they already believe. Uh, another example of this came from uh, Abraham Maslow, who um, uh, sagely noted that to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And you can uh, perhaps see immediately how many of us in clinical practice 
end up doing what we know rather than what is needed. So the sorts of problems that we get into with biomedicine uh, in this area uh, and its inappropriate application to clinical problems can occur really anywhere along the line. And here's a, a little uh, conceptual cycle of um, the steps along the way. I think uh, the problems uh, and indeed some of the um, uh, benefits of biomedicine indeed can become evident at, at each of these steps. Um, important also to recognize that medically unexplained symptoms, as we might call them, or functional disorders, uh, are so prevalent uh, that they pop up all over the place in primary care, in hospital care, you name it. And accordingly, they've accumulated a whole range of different descriptors depending on who's encountered them. And so here's just a few general uh, terms for this common set of problems. And some of them are rather uh, unpleasant or even pejorative, and I would um, uh, sort of caution you against uh, uh, describing somebody as a heart sink patient, although you may well feel heart sink if you see them on your clinic list, but uh, they need to be dealt with just the same, and understanding where they come from and how they get to be there is going to be um, helpful for you and them both. Um, once you drill down into the specialty areas, um, you get a whole range of um, further ramifications of the, no the notion of uh, functional syndromes. And so depending on what subspecialty you might find yourself in, you're going to doubtless encounter people who present with um, real physical symptoms, but uh, precious little, if any, physical pathology to account for this. And so uh, there's no escaping these ones. Um, and I think we'll, we'll come back to this in um, uh, when Bruce the GP and Natalie the health psychologist are uh, further discussing these concepts. Um, I would just alert you to the fact that um, New Zealand's doing pretty well uh, in struggling with this area, more on that later. But I think uh, hats off really to um, Denmark and the Danes who have put together a remarkable series of uh, publications and resources around dealing with this area. So I'm not going to show um, this video here about health anxiety. It happens to be in Danish but with good subtitles. So I'd encourage you to look at that in your own time. Uh, similarly, there's something called uh, uh, bodily distress syndrome. Uh, the same Danish group have uh, captured this rather nicely with a set of uh, video clips of ordinary people in Denmark who've had these experiences. And it just is a reminder uh, for those of us who work here, just as the Danes who work there, uh, just how common these disorders are and how ordinary people often experience them. So I commend both those videos. They're, they're reasonably brief, uh, four or five minutes each. Before we um, get back into the uh, main swing of considering uh, medically unexplained symptoms, uh, I want to make sure that we are uh, on safe ground um, regarding them and their appropriate uh, conceptual category. And we're mainly today going to be talking about the uh, the bottom category, uh, somatic symptom disorder, uh, roughly speaking, is, uh, pops up in DSM-5. Um, rather than malingering or factitious disorder, those are important uh, differentials to consider. Uh, the management uh, is very different and so useful uh, just to keep in mind that um, these things may uh, present in a way that's quite um, similar, but making that distinction uh, between malingering and factitious disorder, and indeed between both of them where the symptoms are intentionally produced, and the actual somatic symptom disorder where there's uh, no awareness of uh, conscious production of symptoms. So just a, a little conceptual basket to keep in mind as we go through.
as I say, the management implications are really quite different for these three. Uh, in considering how uh, MUS distributes in the population, you've already heard how common these presentations are. Uh, there's just a few uh, rough and ready stats for you. Um, it's also worth emphasizing, uh, as Bruce mentioned before, that there's huge cost uh, in, in dealing with them, especially when they're not dealt with adequately and keep coming back. Um, indeed, there's a revolving door syndrome for some of these with the emergency department and sometimes the inpatient wards. A lot of functional impairment, arguably as much as with organic uh, disorders that they mimic. And I think it's fair to say that even here and even in Denmark, uh, they are not necessarily well managed. Um, here's an example from North America where you see the relative uh, preponderance of um, symptom complaints in primary care. And you'll just uh, notice that most of medical school uh, teaches you how to recognize and manage uh, the green bits. Uh, what we're talking about today is the blue bits. And um, one might say, why are we only hearing about these blue bits today? Uh, good question. Um, raise that with your phase director. Symptoms are Common, as said, and here's some New Zealand data uh, just to indicate that, look, we all get these things. The um, average number is uh, five or six a week, uh, probably a little bit more uh, in the elderly and a little bit more uh, in uh, females, but you know, not much really. And so most of these um, just come and go. They don't stick around. It's the ones that stick around that are often presenting to the doctor and may or may not get investigated, may or may not get treated. But symptom experience is an extraordinarily common thing. And so we're really talking about these things that pop up and may uh, stick around long enough to come to medical attention. Trying to put this all together into a conceptual model, uh, Here's one bash we've had at it with a, a couple of Welsh colleagues a few years ago, um, really making the distinction between uh, dysfunction and disease, whereas we're thinking that disease is really something that's pathologically definable. And even at the ultra-structural level, some kind of physical change that accompanies and may cause the symptoms and impairment. Dysfunction, on the other hand, is more of a software problem, if you like. Physiology and psychology may be uh, disturbed and may underlie uh, the presentation, although the mechanisms there are only now beginning to be understood, and Natalie will touch on that shortly. Uh, so just some interim take-home messages from me. Avoid investigation. Um, if you can, over investigation. Obviously, we want to get it right. We don't want to miss important diagnoses, but the risks, the perils of over investigating are likewise well worth avoiding if you can. And it's just part of the game, really, that often we have to accept that we don't really know what's going on. And often there are comorbidities there that we just have to deal with as part of our daily work. So, uh, we can pause now for any uh, comments from the other presenters before we move on to Natalie. Uh, no comment from me, David. Tim? Oh, that was a very good discussion, David. I, uh, nothing to add. I just, um, yeah, there are lots of, uh, just uh, on, the, the way we doctors think, I think there's a, there's quite a lot of uh, bashing of square pegs into round holes, and um, sometimes if it doesn't work, we just bash harder. Whereas um, to pursue the metaphor, we should probably actually look at the shape of the peg sometimes. Excellent. No, the apt metaphor of that one. Right. Well, over to you, Natalie. Okay, thanks. Thanks, David. And thanks for that um, really great introduction to, um, to cover what we're talking about today. Um, so my name is Natalie Tuck. I'm a psychologist and I'm a senior research fellow. And 
I'll talk for 10 to 15 minutes or so about um, the biopsychosocial model and how we can use this to sort of understand and treat these medically unexplained or non-specific physical symptoms. Um, so, so some of the things that I cover have already been talked about briefly. Um, so I'll go over those things quite quickly. Um, but essentially, as David said, physical symptoms such as pain, fatigue, bowel symptoms, um, motor dysfunction, or, or any combination of these are very common in um, medical practice. And historically, it was thought that when there was no sort of underlying disease that was found, then symptoms were being caused by the mind or emotional states. And therefore, people presenting in this manner were sort of considered the realm of psychiatry. Um, and there's also, as, as David mentioned, lots of different diagnostic labels and lots of terminology. So it can get very confusing. And, um, and possibly as a result of this, this area is... Um, commonly misunderstood both by the broader public, but also by um, clinicians and medical professionals. Um, so the, what we know now is that the most practical way of making sense of this is with what we call the biopsychosocial model. Um, this model recognizes that rather than being caused by either the body or the mind, physical symptoms arise due to interactions between biological, psychological, social factors. So um, the biopsychosocial model has been the dominant model in research for, for over 30 years now. However, clinical practice does appear to be taking a long time to catch up. And, um, and in the research field anyway, we are increasingly understanding how these symptoms can occur in the absence of or over and above what can be explained by observable pathology. So um, I was wondering, David, if you wanted to talk a little bit more at all about the, um, the dis I suppose, how this is being taken up in clinical practice compared to in a research area, the biopsychosocial model. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. I, I guess, I mean, my experience is, um, is mainly in uh, consultation liaison psychiatry. And so I see a lot of, uh, a lot of cases where um, the biopsychosocial model is, is uh, known to clinicians, and sometimes you hear lip service being paid to it. But to actually practice it is, uh, is another matter entirely. And in uh, uh, inpatient settings, and we see a lot of uh, patients who uh, fall into this general category of having medically unexplained symptoms. And it is assumed, as you say, that there must be um, something uh, psychiatrically uh, a miss, and you know, we are often asked to comment on these individuals. And nine times out of ten, uh, there's nothing to find through a, a conventional psychiatric assessment. You know, they're not uh, necessarily uh, depressed or suffering from an anxiety disorder or a psychosis, although they might well be uh, upset and frustrated and quite possibly um, scared about the. Um, the possible disease entity that they are experiencing or seem to be. But, you know, to actually make the assumption that they've got a psychiatric disorder because there is no uh, definable physical process going on to explain the symptoms, um, it, just, it just doesn't turn out to be that way. And so we're, we, we, we get frustrated, uh, the physical medicine teams get frustrated and the patients and their families get frustrated. So we're really, you know, all, all around a bit, bit stuck. And that's why I think um, pausing and taking a step back is, uh, is essential in order to um, usefully formulate these cases. Um, Tim and Bruce might have a comment about how often um, the model, uh, as you describe it, is actually applied in practice. Uh, Bruce here. It's fairly variable. Some um, GPs have a very uh, 
biopsychosocial approach and um, will will take everything into account and others stick to traditional training of dealing with it as as if it's a problem of biomedicine and then get a bit frustrated with patients um, who aren't getting better uh, if if the biomedical answer was the answer so um, it does uh, it does cause difficulties in practice but I think there is a move New Zealand GPS are very uh, we number one in the world usually for uh, patient centered consultations and I think being more patient centered gets you much much more further on that biomedicine is I'm a doctor and I'm right whereas with patient centered approach it's much more a negotiation and a discussion I think you had the word negotiation on one of your slides there David um, which I rather liked over to you Right. Natalie, do you want to carry on from there? Sure. sure. Um, so, so on the next slide, um, it simply just summarizes some of the more common functional somatic syndromes. And, and the reason I put this in here is just for people to be aware that um, these symptoms often present in clusters and they are sort of well-recognized patterns of symptoms for which there are many um, clear sort of diagnostic features. It's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is sort of on the right where we can see without the kind of diagnostic criteria, just that these patterns of symptoms do tend to fall in groups, but, but there's also often overlap. Um, so on the next slide, it's actually comes from the same study that was included in one of David's earlier slides. Um, based in Auckland, a survey of um, around a thousand people in New Zealand and it was found that sort of 30 to 40 percent of people every day are reporting symptoms. Um, most commonly are symptoms like pain, fatigue, headaches and um, muscle stiffness and as you mentioned David on average people just generally well people out and about report approximately five symptoms per week so it is normal to, to experience symptoms without underlying disease or damage and these can um, occur without pathology. Um, but when people develop what we might call a functional disorder or medically unexplained symptoms, these symptoms become really severe and start affecting their daily life. And typically with these kind of syndromes, um, pain is often a presenting feature. It's not always the case, but it does tend to be the thing that people complain about um, and seek care for. And um, it's useful to know that um, pain is the leading cause of disability worldwide, chronic pain. And in New Zealand, it's affecting about 20% of our population. So it's relevant across all disciplines to have an understanding of chronic pain and its sort of assessment and treatment. And I suppose, given my background, that's that um, most of what I talk about will sort of have a um, emphasis, I suppose, on chronic pain because that's what I'm more familiar with. Um, so in terms of the mechanism of, of how symptoms can exist without an observable pathology, there's not time to cover all the different mechanisms that are being examined in detail. So I'll just focus on one today, which is this idea of central sensitization. Um, and there's growing support for this in, in a range of medically unexplained conditions, but in particular for chronic pain. And, and the best way I suppose to explain it is to first talk about normal sensation. So this, this idea that there are things happening in our body all the time that we don't notice and that we don't feel. And you might be able to see, or it might be a bit small, but in the top image, we can see that um, in normal sensation, it's, we can easily differentiate symptoms that are threatening or dangerous, such as heat or pressure um, from, from neutral sensations, such as touch. And these are processed along different pathways. Um, our nervous system sort of uses this process to determine which information is necessary for our survival. Again, sort of potentially painful things or sensations such as hunger. 
um, and which information can be filtered out, things that aren't necessary. So things like normal digestive function or the sensation of clothing against skin. We don't notice these things all the time. But for some people, we now understand that this filter stops working properly. So the body starts sending more signals than usual. And this can be termed peripheral sensitization. But also that more information is passing through to the brain. And that's where the term central sensitization comes from. So it's an amplification of messages. And, and this occurs at the level of the synapse in the spinal cord. So when this occurs, the brain is receiving more input than is normal. And this input suggesting a threat. So this corresponds also with um, heightened sympathetic nervous system activity and, and sort of a chronic stress state and what we might call a positive feedback loop, which then can contribute to more symptoms. Um, there's, there's growing evidence that this process is relevant to a range of medically unexplained symptoms or syndromes. Um, but at this stage, there is still debate and it's not, we wouldn't say it's conclusive across all of these, but these are the sort of domains where there has been some support for the role of the central sensitization. I don't know, does anyone want to comment at this point or should I continue on? Yeah, perhaps just a, just a brief comment, Natalie, from um, my uh, forays into the uh, world of pain clinics. I gather there's uh, a widespread view that uh, sometimes pain syndromes are more treatable uh, early on, and that one of the reasons for that might be that um, as pain disorders become chronic, there is actually something of a, uh, a physical, uh, perhaps ultrastructural, but nonetheless physical change in places like the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and elsewhere that may actually uh, cross that divide between something that is functional to begin with, but actually becomes more pathological with time. Would, would that accord with your view? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So acute pain, so pain that's around for, you know, the, the arbitrary cutoff is three months, but essentially in the short term, pain is useful. It, it alerts us to damage or danger and, and it protects us from, from further injury, I suppose. Um, but we know that over time, that um, usefulness becomes less and it becomes less about sort of damage and injury and more about changes in the brain and the nervous system. So the longer that sticks around for with um, you know, neuroplasticity and so on, the more changes can occur in response to pain. So it becomes less, yeah, as you said, um, less functional, I suppose, or less adaptive and useful over time. And those um, changes in the, the brain and the spinal cord um, become more set in place, I suppose, and harder to modify. So early treatment or prevention is, is key, really, if possible. Natalie, can, you may be coming on to discuss this later, but I was interested to see PTSD up there. And that made me thinking about adverse early childhood experiences. Um, and do they, in, things like that, in, uh, because some, in the very, uh, the example David gave at the beginning, um, sexual abuse was a possible factor behind that young woman's um, presentation. Uh, does, I, again, you may come to talk about this in a minute, but the early child, adverse early childhood experiences, do they impact on this type of illness? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so prior events, um, I, I, know, I know we'll talk about it in a bit more detail, but early adverse events, um, are known to be highly prevalent in these populations. And there are several different pathways, I suppose, by which that can happen. One is anything that I suppose primes the nervous system to respond strongly to threat. So, so if people have um, had early adverse events, they're likely to have a heightened or stronger threat response. Um, likewise, we can look at things like learning and conditioning and the kind of coping strategies people have developed that might have been helpful at that time. 
but then become unhelpful in the long term. So there's lots of different mechanisms, I suppose, but it is certainly a risk factor. Um, also, I suppose adverse childhood events are extremely common in the general population as well. And it's useful to bear in mind that when people do present with chronic pain, um, a large proportion do have those events, but then I suppose there are people that have those adverse events that don't go on to develop these symptoms and syndromes too. But I'll talk I about was, that. Um, I was listening the other day to um, uh, my supervisor who's based in San Francisco and works in the um, uh, Veterans Affairs Department. And she was talking about uh, many patients with PTSD are waiting for their symptoms to go away or get better before they can start living. And I was just thinking of these chronic pain patients. They're waiting for their pain to be cured before they can get on with life. It's a very sort of common pattern, isn't it? Um, and uh, whereas I would suggest people need to get on with their lives in the presence of some level of pain. Uh, pain, we can't escape pain, a physical or emotional pain as a human um, and we need to get on with our lives. I don't know if you've got any comment on that, Natalie. Um, yeah, I do. I'll, I'll, I'll make, first I'll just address that idea because PTSD has come up a couple of times. Um, so chronic pain and PTSD are highly comorbid with one another. People, the kind of people that develop chronic pain are also the kind of people that um, have PTSD and would call that sort of a shared vulnerability. Um, so, so they might have sort of similar background features, but then if they go on to have, say, a motor vehicle or an accident or something, um, the, then we end up with comorbid PTSD and chronic pain that are sort of mutually maintaining each other. So, um, so the pain makes it harder for people to get on with their lives and live despite their PTSD, and PTSD can also uh, make it harder for people to recover from pain because of the impact it has on sleep and mood and so on. Um, so they are a common co-diagnosis, I suppose. And, and like you said, um, rather than focusing, I suppose, on the cause, focusing on how people can get back into their lives and move forward with an element of pain or with an element of um, PTSD is a useful way to approach it. And I think you're coming on to that presently, Natalie. I will, I will. <laughs> Um, so, so in looking what can be done about, about uh, medically unexplained symptoms or in particular chronic pain, given that these are sort of arise from changes in the nervous system and there's nothing structural to fix and there's no clear disease to eliminate, uh, we use a biomedical model, um, oh sorry, we use a biopsychosocial model to understand what might be going on and to identify appropriate treatments. So I'll go through each of these in terms of the vulnerability factors, participating events, and then the things that might be keeping those symptoms going on when we feel like they should have probably resolved. Um, so in considering why it might happen, we've touched on this briefly already, but it's, but it's sort of thought that factors that will prime the nervous system to respond in what we might call an overprotective manner. So there's not usually a single cause, but there's evidence supporting the role of biological, psychological, and social factors. And again, the interaction between these. So there's evidence supporting the role for genetics and epigenetics here. We also know that prolonged exposure to stress or severe stress is a risk factor. Um, adverse childhood events. We know that um, preterm birth, particularly in previous cohorts where babies were in NICU, and underwent um, early painful procedures, puts people at increased risk of developing chronic pain later in life. And they've identified the role of um, glial cells in that, but I won't go into that right now. Um, but also previous disease or injury, and there's a role also for um, learning and conditioning and social contexts. So these interact to sort of increase the vulnerability of a person developing chronic pain. But then there's typically a, um, triggering event or, or something might happen which then makes a person present to you here and now. Um, this might be a recent accident or injury, um, but also there are instances where symptoms appear to develop spontaneously over time 
And then people might present to you now due to a change in circumstances, or it could be that a family member has encouraged them to seek treatment, particularly for younger people. So having a look at why they're coming to you now, because in many instances, symptoms will have been around for a while before you actually see these people. Um, and then when we look at why symptoms are, are hanging around, why it's not getting better, it's useful again to think about biological, psychological and social factors that are sort of maintaining the symptoms or disability. So we've already talked about changes in the central nervous system and these, these aren't easy to change quickly. So this is a maintaining factor. And um, there's also structural changes observed in the brain and, and these can be slow to, slow to change back. Um, we have also talked briefly about sympathetic predominance. So once people are experiencing symptoms for a while, we tend to see that they're in a high state of sympathetic arousal and stress reactivity, which then in turn contributes to more symptoms, particularly symptoms like fatigue. Um, and then of course, there's the way people respond to their symptoms, which can be helpful or unhelpful. If people find their symptoms particularly distressing, which they usually will if you're seeing them in clinic, then, then it can lead to things like fear avoidance. They might have unhelpful levels of resting. They might be using medications that can be making things worse. Um, if people are searching for a mechanical solution or looking for, for a better explanation, um, they might be seeking more surgery or more medications or interventions. Um, if people think about their symptoms in an anxiety-provoking way, then that increases disability over time. Um, and also when people are involved in litigation or ACC or just in a situation where they feel that they need to prove that their symptoms are real or prove that they, um, that they need help, it can make it harder for people to get better. Um, so then in terms of treatment, it's typically found that focusing on the perpetuating factors is where you get the most use. So this might involve the use of medications if it's appropriate to make people more comfortable, but a key element really is what we'd call behavioral activation. So taking steps to reduce disability and to reduce the functional limitations that are arising as a result of symptoms. So that, um, I think Bruce mentioned before, is about getting back into life despite the presence of symptoms. So it's reassuring people that, um, that tests have come back showing that there's no need for further medical intervention and then shifting the focus to um, symptom management, I suppose. A key element here is also helping people develop strategies to manage symptoms, and this can include sort of cognitive or behavioral skills um, anything that can wind down that sort of nervous system activity. So things like relaxation, helping improve sleep and so on. Um, and this can be delivered by psychologists, but it's also frequently and just as effectively done with, um, by GPs, other medical professionals, nurses and so on. Um, so this is really good for patient education, this handout here. Again, it was developed by the Danish group, Our House, and the same people that made the videos that David introduced before. And this is something I use with patients in terms of giving them a clear educational understanding of what's going on and reassuring them that um, we don't believe that their symptoms are all in their head, but that in terms of management, it's less about finding a fix and more about focusing on how they can um, regain their quality of life despite the presence of uncomfortable symptoms. Um, treatment is typically best delivered by a multidisciplinary team and at, um, in the context of pain, this will often include GPs, physios, nurses, and so on. Um, I've got here, yeah, occupational therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists can be involved, and pain medicine specialists. These often have a background in um, anesthetics, but not always, and pharmacists are really useful too. Um, so overall, just to, just to summarize what I've said here is these kind of non-specific symptoms are very common. 
clear organic pathology is often not present. Um, symptom perception is not purely biological or psychological. They're, they're not actually distinct processes. They co-occur together. Um, mechanisms, we're, we're getting a reasonably good understanding of some of the mechanisms. But continued efforts to find structural causes are often not helpful and actually can cause more damage, as has already been mentioned. So the treatment is typically about um, providing a clear explanation for symptoms and addressing the perpetuating factors that are contributing to the ongoing symptoms. So that's the end of my bit. Um, if anyone has any comments, please go ahead. Um, thanks, Natalie. Just uh, a question which I don't know the answer to, but um, bearing in mind Philip Larkin's famous poem about um, your parents, um, does parenting style impact on, on how people grow up reacting to um, everyday symptoms? For sure. Yeah, um, good question, Tim. And, um, and that's where we sort of talk about learning, I suppose, is the environment that we grow up in and the way that we see our parents respond to illness or the way that we're treated when we are, do have symptoms um, when we're young, has a really strong impact on how we respond to symptoms later in life. Um, likewise, the way, the, the sort of early relationships we have with caregivers will determine later life healthcare behaviours too. So that's sort of in the attachment literature. Um, we can see, you know, people that have good, comfortable, um, loving relationships when they're young are um, sort of, I suppose, better at navigating the healthcare system and seeking care when they need it and managing when they don't than, than others. So early life context um, plays a big role in how people respond to symptoms. Perhaps also worth mentioning that um, uh, intrauterine environment is also quite important. And so if, if uh, mums are, you know, really stressed or victimized during pregnancy, uh, there's likely to be uh, effects on the, um, on the fetus and the developing child. Uh, whether those are epigenetic or it happens through some other mechanism, I guess, is still uh, being worked out, but there's no doubt that um, the experience of, of, uh, of a stressed mother um, during pregnancy uh, has long-lasting um, impacts, at least in terms of vulnerability to all sorts of trouble, but I, I would be uh, surprised if that didn't include um, uh, functional syndromes as well. Uh, loosely speaking, I guess you could consider that to be, be another uh, adverse childhood experience, just uh, dialing it back before birth a bit. Yeah. Um, any, any further discussion points before we move on? Right. Well, I'm wondering if uh, Andrew is with us. Are you there, Andrew? Most definitely am. Ah, oh, terrific. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, looking forward to your uh, arrival, and we've got a, uh, a little case uh, that we'd like to um, throw in your, your general direction here. Um, the celebrated case number two. Over to you. So this is one of the cases from the, the, um, the case booklet or the clinical scenarios. Uh, so the case is a seven-year-old little boy who's brought to mum because he's got abdominal pain, which he's been present daddy for a long time. And I think the emphasis here is on a long time rather than something that's just acute. He isn't really able to describe the character of the pain, but says he gets it most days. And he misses at least a couple of days of school each week. And, you know, those of you who've had kids will know that, you know, for a kid to miss every day is quite a big deal to, 
because you usually rest them off to school a few days each week, but a couple of days off school each week will be causing a considerable amount of worry to the parents. He's got no other systemic symptoms, um, might have lost a bit of weight. Um, but that's often the case that people will say things like that. Um, and perhaps he's been a little bit lethargic, but all a bit non-specific. The only thing that's sort of hard is the fact he's been having pain and it's leading him to um, take a couple of days of school off each week. Can we have the next slide. So we're not given any kind of um, physical exam, but I think we can take from the clinical scenarios that he actually has no obvious clinical signs. And in, other than an acute situation, it's not infrequent at all that people with, and, and kids in particular, I suppose, will have no real physical signs. And there's a whole bunch of different kinds of uh, potential diagnoses here. And as a surgeon, we, the, I tend to think of things that a surgeon might do, might think about, but need to remember this kid's come to the GP and the GP has a much wider range of possibilities. And it's one of the real challenges, of course, of being a GP is that you don't have all the tests and you haven't had the case filtered by, by someone else beforehand. Um, and you often have very anxious family members who don't know what's going on. And these are things that might be going through your mind. So is a kid constipated? Well, that's fairly easily sorted out. Does, does he or she have fast bowel motions regularly? Are they hard? Are they, has there been a change in bowel habit recently? Abdominal migraine, I've really no idea quite what that means, but I, there are some migraines that affect the abdomen, but more often than elsewhere. But again, this is, this is usually an intense pain that happens not every day or every second day. We'll pass by the third one, not because I don't think it's important, but because I think that is probably the most important. Well, there is, is an important issue. Um, appendicitis is an acute problem. There are cases, people who get occasionally appendicitis that you might get and then it might settle down, but it, that would be, you know, it wouldn't be every day. Lactose intolerance, well, you could fairly easily check that out by stopping the kid taking lactose, but Again, I, you would find that the kid wouldn't be taking milk because they would have worked that out already themselves. Celiac disease, gastroenteritis is more an acute sort of problem and functional abdominal pain, whatever that means. But just going back to those other three, most things that are serious in kids, and you can include, I think on the next slide, there's some other things, but certainly in the case, the uh, clinical scenarios, there's some other possibilities. But most of the serious kind of problems that have been occurring over three months in a kid will result in them looking pretty sick and uh, will, they'll be losing weight. And kids tend to put on weight, so losing weight is quite a significant thing. In fact, not gaining weight is quite a big deal. Uh, in adults, it's obviously very different. But uh, while the mum says that the kid's been losing weight, it's probably fairly easy to put them on a scale um, and perhaps check a previous measurement or even put them against some kind of normals and see where they fitted previously. So you're really left with, um, then you're going to have to ask yourself, what is, what sort of investigations you need to do? And, and I'm a bit of a fan of doing as few as possible. So I think once you've done a clinical exam and you've taken a bit more history and you've checked the weight, then I think you're going to need to ask, I think the investigations are probably some additional kinds of questions. And I'd want to know about what kind of stresses are going on at home. I'd want to know what school's like for the little guy. Is he being bullied? Um, is, is there trouble there? Is he doing well academically or is he not? Um, how's he, is he playing sports? Has he got friends? Because uh, these are actually probably the more important questions here. I guess you could do some basic blood tests if you like. Um, I guess, uh, I guess a haemoglobin and um, a CRP, um, perhaps some basic um, other markers might be helpful, but you need to be a bit careful about making this very medical um, or very surgical as the case might be. I, I think the other question here is about where the buck stops. And I think, uh, you know, it's easy to pass these kids on to a pediatrician or a pediatric surgeon or a physician of some kind, but 
you know, that just, that just in, entrenching the idea that there's something serious going on here. And I, while you, one of the problems with your GP, of course, is you do exist in this space where you're always, you're never quite sure, um, or you're often not quite sure. And so, you know, there are some people who do a lot of tests, x-ray, CT scans, endoscopies, and so on. And that's what's going to happen if they end up with a specialist, I think. So I think you need to be a little bit careful. Was, this, was there a next slide here? I've forgotten. Am I supposed to discuss this? Yeah, yes, please, Andrew. So I think, I think the, the first thing, how do you address this anxious patient or family? I think the first thing is they're terribly worried something serious going on. Everybody's thinking in this situation, my kid have, does my kid have cancer? Or does my kid have some other terrible problem that's going to plague them for the rest of their lives? And that depends a lot on what they've looked up on the internet. It depends a lot on what sort of family history they've got. Um, it depends on their own uh, own experiences, their own appetite for risk and so on and so forth. And so you need, to, I, I, I like to use terms like I'm 95% or I'm 99% sure that there's whatever, that's nothing going on or I don't think there's anything serious. I think it's important you don't say there's nothing going on. I think that's pretty, um, that is kind of um, dangerous because, you know, this kid plainly is missing school and plainly is complaining of pain. And just to say there's nothing going on, go home, it's all in his head, uh, isn't very helpful. Um, the cure is difficult with breaking bad news. I did not make these slides. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. um, so there's, there's a quite an interesting situation here because you need to make sure that your counts, you, you're, you're making this sound positive. So not that I don't think there's anything serious going on. You don't want people to get the idea that you don't think that there's anything that needs to be done or that you're not taking them seriously. Sometimes people do like to have a diagnosis to hang their hats on. And I think it's a lot to do with the fact that we like to, it, often if, you, if you're sitting around and you're waiting for a, a test, you just want to know the test. And in some respects, it doesn't matter whether the test shows you've got cancer or doesn't, you, you can't actually deal with the problem until you've got some sort of answer. And so um, you need to be a little bit careful about how you break this good news that there's nothing serious going on. Uh, because you just may create more anxiety because you haven't told them what is going on. Um, so I think it's important that you, you, you know, you do take those other questions. It, it's important to note that a, a history in medicine is, gives you, it, it depends on the situation, but can give you um, almost all of the diagnosis a lot of the time. Plenty of psychiatrists don't do any blood tests and they, they make diagnoses all the time that are often correct and useful. Um, there are other tests, other groups, of course, and those who are managing cancer, for instance, where the actual test is perhaps 90% of, of the diagnosis or 95% of the diagnosis. The rest is how to manage it with the individual. So in this situation, you may be able to say, look, I don't think there's anything super serious going on here. I don't think it's cancer. I don't think it's inflammatory bowel disease. Or You can list some of the things they might have demonstrated concern. And you say, you know, I, I think this is likely to be something going on at school or something going on at home. Tell us what's going on there. And that will often help to bring things out. Now, sometimes people ask you for other investigations of treatment. And I think you need to be quite strong about this. So almost every test has a, 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 um, a, a true positive and a, a, um, a true negative and a false positive, false negative, etc. So you need to balance that up. Almost every test has some danger. It may be as little as getting a bruise from a blood test, or it may be as much as getting a perforation from doing a colonoscopy, uh, or getting an infection from doing a lumbar puncture. So, you know, people need to understand that those none of those tests are necessary, are, are, are entirely benign. And I think this is where you need to stand your ground. And if you're absolutely or almost certain that you're correct on this matter, then you need to be firm about that. Now, I usually have myself a back out clause and the back out clause is I'm 99% certain, but there's a 1% chance that I'm not right on this. And these are the sort of things we need to watch out for to, to, to deal with that. And this kid, I would suggest that he continues, that he loses weight. And I'd suggest that they should weigh him regularly. If he does start losing weight, then there might be something more serious going on. So, you need to give people some kind of way in which they can participate in that treatment or investigation themselves. Because at the end of the day, that relationship between you and the parent or the you and the patient 
is very important. If they don't actually trust you, I'm not sure it's going to be solved by doing a bunch more investigations or doing some alternative treatments. That's great. Uh, slide, David? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. There's one, one last right? uh, domain in which uh, your comment would be invited. Um, and you touched on it just before regarding uh, mm -hmm. the extent to which there may be overdiagnosis and overtreatment in a surgical setting. Wondered if you'd have a, a comment about this. So, uh, look, every surgeon has their own opinion on this, and it depends a little bit on, it, it depends on two important factors, your own ability or tolerance for risk, and the person you're dealing with's tolerance for risk. If you have a low tolerance for risk, and the person has a low tolerance for risk, you're going to do a lot of overdiagnosis and potentially some overtreatment. Uh, if you both have a high appetite for risk, then um, you may under treating or under-diagnosing. So some sort of balance is required. An understanding of yourself and an understanding of the individual patient um, are very, very important when you're thinking about this. Over-diagnosis leads you to leads a number of problems. One is every test has its own complication profile, as I said. Every test has a set of false positives and true and uh, false negatives, and those are a big problem. Um, and uh, you sometimes find out things you don't want to know, which can lead to um, so you may find, um, so we get a lot of CT scans done on people now for one reason or another. And we find all sorts of little um, lumps and bumps around the place that actually aren't a problem, but lead people to over-investigate. So a very small ditzel found on a chest, uh, chest CT can result in people doing a biopsy, which can result in a pneumothorax, which can result in having to have a chest tube, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a small lesion on the adrenal gland can lead to people doing blood tests, again, fine needle aspirations, and causing trouble. And so over-diagnosis is a problem. Over-treatment, again, a lot of people, uh, once, we invest, once we found the laparoscope, we started being able to do operations that we might necessarily not have done previously. So the number of gallbladders taken out after the laparoscope was far more than the number of gallbladders that were taken out before the laparoscope. Did the population get any better? No. So, um, and every one of those people was exposed again to some sort of complication. So the incidence of bile duct injury went up and a bile duct injury is a very bad problem, for instance, for laparoscopic cholecystectomy or open cholecystectomy too. It was almost unknown in the open cholecystectomy era, but nowadays, and nowadays it's not so much of a problem either, but for a problem early on, it was a big deal. So overdiagnosis, overtreatment is a big deal and a problem. What should be done about it? Well, I think, again, you need to know your own tolerance for risk. You need to know about the patient's tolerance for risk. You need to know, um, you need to, some, some stage in the game, you need to draw the line and say, this is what we think is the problem. And um, this is what, you know, what we've decided we're gonna do about it together. Um, yes, there's a tiny bit of risk about that, but to find out, to be 100% sure you'd have to be dead and we have to do an autopsy and I don't want to get there. So, um, you know, you need to have ways in which you communicate with your patients, probably better than I just did there, but, um, you know, there needs to be a way in which you, you know, you talk to patients about the small chances you might get it wrong, um, what, what, um, what would happen if you got it wrong and how they might participate, helping to find that out and so on. But it's important that people know that, surgical treatment, surgical diagnosis is not without risk. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm struck by the fact that there is uh, a remarkable overlap between the perils, <coughs> the twin perils, if you like, of uh, overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis when applied in the surgical setting, general medical, psychiatric, I presume the same even applies in primary care that, you know, one has to hit the sweet spot between doing what's necessary and what's reasonable, but um, not much more because then the, the um, risk benefit balance tilts the wrong way, I think, if one does go too far. And that seems to obtain uh, regardless of which uh, clinical specialty one's in. And I think very tough for the um, doctors in training who are watching this, David, because they're struggling with learning uh, diagnosis. And then we start introducing over-diagnosis and over-treatment and under-diagnosis and under-treatment. And um, 
it's a dance you learn as you get more experienced um, as a clinician. Um, one of the things I like about um, Andrew being on this um, webinar or on this talk is he says when he was an undergraduate, he wouldn't have come to this lecture. But but I, tried to get out of it. I tried to get out of it today, actually, but David kept on hanging, um, going after me. So I'm still not sure I want to go to it, but it's still useful. Yeah, <laughs> no, we, love, we love having you here, Andrew, and it's the one time you and I get to teach together. But I think that the issue is, of course, um, you mentioned it beautifully, the unfiltered problem of primary care. And one of the things we do, and you mentioned it, Andrew, is use time as the diagnostic test. But sometimes you're dealing with a very pushy family who want an answer. So the path of least resistance is to me is to refer somebody to Andrew. So, of course, he gets, and I, I may not think there's very much he can do, but it's a way of keeping the parents um, satisfied. And um, so that's why Andrew ends up with uh, my difficult cases, because I'm coming under pressure. I can't talk them out of it. I also loved your comment, Andrew, about uh, having them participate in the process. And that thing about weighing a child, I think, is quite important. It's certainly something we do in primary care with abdominal pain. Um, it often is a thing about school anxiety, family dysfunction. One of the psychological theories around it, it's called triangulation. And the child gets sick to stop the parents from fighting with each other because it gives them something common to focus on instead of their, their distress with each other. Um, but that's, that's taking this to another level. So, um, so some great comments, there, Andrew, and, and lovely to have you on the, uh, the webinar. Right, so Bruce, I think the stage is yours for the, the next bit. Okay, okay. I'm just going to think... switch off my video because my internet is a bit shonky here, but I'm still around. Right. Okay. So I'm going to talk at any time. Okay, so next slide, please, David. So, um, what field is this? So, the, I don't particularly like the term medically unexplained symptoms because it seems to play into that medical model. Just one more test and you will have the answer. And I do pref prefer the term that's becoming a bit more common is illness without disease, which is much more looking at the biopsychosocial model, which has now been around, as Natalie said, for about 30 years. Next slide, please. And um, of course, this, this shows itself in modern medicine, if you're a neurologist, then the, the uh, medically unexplained symptom will be headaches. If it's orthopedics, it's back pain. If it's ENT, it's tinnitus, globus, dizziness. If it's cardiology, it's chest pain. If it's respiratory, it's short of breath. Gastroenterology has irritable bowel. Medicine has chronic fatigue. So each discipline has its own medically unexplained symptoms, so you can't get away from it. Uh, this slide is from a tertiary care hospital in London. Uh, so this is tertiary referral, and of course you can't get away from it. If, you're, if you, you can see the range going there from 37% to 66% from dental through to gynecology. So these medically unexplained symptoms are in a third to two thirds of patients even in a tertiary center. Next slide. Um, so psychiatric morbidity is not necessarily associated with the presence of, of medically unexplained symptoms, but more common in those with multiple symptoms. And I guess in primary care, if a patient comes in and points to their head and says it hurts here, and then their face, and then their chest, and then their abdomen, and then their legs, and then their ankles. Um, either they've got something very serious going on or it's going to be a medically unexplained symptom. And you sort of suss this out pretty quickly in primary care. You get a gut feeling that probably you're not going to find anything organic. And so it enables you to dance with 
with the psychosocial. And the good GP um, will not go down a biomedical path and then say, there's nothing wrong with you. It must be all in your mind. You, you deal with both where possible. Next slide. So it's all about suffering. And this comes from Cassell, who opened up this uh, topic in uh, 1982 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and we often, it, it's about the suffering of the patient. And we tend to lack the knowledge because we work in a dichotomy, disease or no disease. Uh, but we sort of need to under, under the su understand the suffering. Otherwise, we will fail to relieve it. And as you've heard already today, potentially add to it. But it can be very frustrating for the doctor sometimes. Next slide. Um, so we've talked a little bit about structural pain and functional pain. Uh, structural pain is pretty straightforward. Um, that's what we're very good at in biomedicine. Functional pain is the dysfunction of the, the central or the sympathetic nervous system. And Norman Doidge describes this beautiful, beautifully in his book, The Brain's Way of Healing. He's wrote, written a couple of bestsellers there. So if you want some light, interesting reading, he's got some pretty good stuff. Next slide, please. So in terms of the wider diagnosis, we in primary care sometimes try and get the patient to link the physical with the psychological. And some patients are very good at that. Um, but I would heighten here to say, make the point that it's not okay to miss a psychological diagnosis. You get the feeling in physical medicine that if you miss a psychological diagnosis, it doesn't matter. But I think that's just as much malpractice as, um, as missing a physical diagnosis because uh, it can cost the health system a lot of money and resource use. And I like to use the term institutionalized malpractice for the young patient who goes to an ED department with non-cardiac chest pain. What is non-cardiac chest pain? It's a nonsense diagnosis. Um, the patient's usually having a panic attack or got panic disorder. And with a little bit more time and a few more questions, that could be quite easily diagnosed. But the number of people who go into emergency departments and get chest X-rays, ECG, and troponins is, um, is hard to believe sometimes. It's, it's sort of unfathomable and it still happens today, regrettably. Next slide, please. Key issue is can the patient relate their life to their pain? If not, then. Next slide, please. We need to find an explanation for that pain. And one of the ones I often use is that um, there's a short circuit in your body uh, maybe in a hundred years we'll understand what the mechanism is, but at the moment we don't, and we don't have a name for it. One of the things that struck me when I started doing general practice is how many vague symptoms people people got that just weren't fake. Lady with chest pain and pain on her thigh. Well, what's that? What's that? It doesn't make any sense anatomically. And as Natalie showed you, that enormous list of symptoms of which we all have five per week on average. Um, so there was a very good qualitative study in the BMJ in 1999, where they talked about self-management and having some sort of explanation for this um, that may not make any sense to your medical colleagues, but makes sense to the patient is important. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a good reframe. I often say to people with uh, low back pain, Half of the pain's in your back and the other half is in your brain where you, um, where you feel the pain. And I can't do much about the, the pain in your back, but I might be able to do something with your brain and help you with that. Next slide. So we want to avoid the train wreck. Next slide. The next slide, and it's been alluded to before, do not say there's nothing wrong with you or the patient will think, you think it's all in my head. And that's, that's a pretty difficult criticism to duck. Um, the relations is, relationship's essential. Andrew mentioned participate in the process. Otherwise they feel abandoned and then they start feeling unstable. 
Uh, they may leave the practice, which is problematic. Uh, they may complain to things like the HDC. I'm the complaints officer in our clinic at the moment, and the complaints are virtually never about mistakes. They're all about perception of communication. That we get complaints and we respond to them and we fix them when we make a mistake. And then there's uh, most, virtually all the complaints are about um, uh, miscommunication, poor communication, feeling, and patients need to be seen, heard, and understood. Every human needs to be seen, heard, and understood. And if they're not, they will start to feel wounded. Next slide. Okay, so the task of the GP is to do a history and physical. I always talk about, and you would have got this in fourth year, a work, love, play questionnaire. That's getting the, the, the psychosocial, emotional context of the patient. Um, we use questionnaires. We use the PHQ-9, which gives us a measure, a linear measure of mood, and a GAD-7, which gives us a measure of worried thinking. And you'll know I consciously avoid the label depression and anxiety there. Um, we try and give an explanation or a medicine um, a mechanism. I mentioned the word dancing. Often you have to dance with the patient. It's a negotiation. We're dancing with the biomedical and the psychosocial. Let's leave it a few weeks and weigh your child and see what happens. If they continue, continue to lose weight, we may get the pediatricians to have a look look at them. Um, good GPs, I think, avoid referral. It's very easy to do a referral. Um, and I think the, the challenge is, is not to, unless you think something can be achieved by it, unless the patient is pushing you or threatening you. And the key thing for, for patients is to learn to expand their life. Next slide, please. So this is a 20 year old male I saw a while ago, and he was so anxious that when he went out, he vomit, vomited. He didn't want to go job seeking because he was afraid he might vomit. Um, so I was quite happy to sit with him. He had a target weight of 60 kilograms. It was 58 in the office. And unfortunately his parents sort of said, well, you must, you need to be 60 kilograms. And of course that sort of, hovering over a 20 year old male doesn't help. His PHQ-9 was 15 in December. Um, that's on a score of 0 to 27. And his GAD-7 was 17 on a 0 to 21. That's quite typically an anxiety picture for, um, for a patient, if you like. Very high uh, worry score, moderate uh, mood score. So he was referred to me by a GP colleague. Next slide. Um, and when he came in the office, he wanted a, a vomit bucket in the room. And as I say, his parents got anxious that he wasn't 60 kilograms. And this was his work, love, play. So he wasn't getting a job. So how he spent his day was three out of 10. Uh, contact with his friends was five out of 10. Uh, intimate partner, didn't have an intimate partner. Uh, family, he rated as 6 out of 10, and play was 7 out of 10. And the key thing, in every distressed patient you'll see, there'll be some constriction of their life. And there's, like, his everyday life, his work is not going well, how he spends his day, he's not communicating with his friends, things aren't so great with his family, a reasonable level of, of play, but that's a fairly shut down life. Next slide, please. So I got him, I set him some tasks to expand his life. And this is a key thing you must do when you're negotiating lifestyle change. You've got to get the patient to score it. So I said, well, uh, would you be willing to contact your friends? Yes. How likely are you to do that? Eight out of 10. If he'd said six out of 10, I would have said, we need to renegotiate re that. Patient needs to get seven or more out of 10. Otherwise, if he gave me a two out of 10, his subconscious is saying to me, I don't want to do that. You're dreaming, doctor. Uh, I suggested he ask his dad out to the movies because his dad had this bit of a love-hate relationship with his dad. That was a 10 out of 10. And to learn to be in charge of his life. So that was a 10 out of 10. So that was pretty good. Next slide. The next visit, 
PHQ-9 had dropped down to nine, GAD down to eight. And that's pretty normal in primary care. So patients come in very distressed at the first visit and they improve with time. He thought he'd lost weight, which wasn't true. Um, he'd gone to a new cafe for lunch and that was an eight out of 10. And I just had to say to him, let's park the issue of 60 kilograms because this desire to get to 60 kilograms was a solution and it had become the new problem. So what people do is the solution very rapidly becomes the problem. And the 60 kilogram target for him had become a problem which he would worry about again. And I said to him, you may never weigh 60 kilograms. I don't care so long as you're functioning. And I pointed out to him that he didn't need the vomit bucket that day, um, that he got through the consultation, because normally he would pick up a vomit bucket and have it on his lap. So this is me dancing with this young man. Next visit. Visit three, really his PHQ and GAD are down into the normal range. His weight was stable. Did we need to check it? Hard to know. Uh, he felt better and was in charge of his life. Would, would ask, it asked his parents to back off because in a sense, they were, he's an adult male, but he's living with his parents. So in a sense, the, the risk is he's going to behave like a child and they will keep behaving like a parent. He needs to become into an adult, adult relationship with his parents. Needs to learn to trust his experience, not what his mind say, and be willing to practice change. Next slide, please. So this is the futility discussion you sometimes have to have with people. Stop the testing and referring because referral is a discretionary process. And the problem is a GP, if you refer somebody, the specialist thinks they have to do something. So they'll order a scan or use a telescope or do something um, because they feel that's they're, they're keeping the GP happy. So the GP is keeping the parents happy in Andrew's case. And then um, uh, the, the surgeon or the specialist is keeping the GP happy. So there's this um, the domino effect of everyone trying to keep everybody happy, but we're not actually solving the problem for the patient. Um, we sometimes have to admit that the, the patients and the doctors feel it's stuck. Uh, consider living a valued life despite um, persisting symptoms. And actually, there's a large bunch of uh, common society that feels they should be asymptomatic. We know from that work from Dr. Petrie that it's very common to have symptoms. So the aim in life is not to remove symptoms, but perhaps to get people to be willing to live with them and, and get on with them. Next slide. Role of others. So as a GP, you have a relationship with the patient and you should use that and you will discover when you are doctors that there is a certain level of respect for that. Um, you may want to use psychologists. They're not always the answer. Uh, the patient may not want to start over again and the patient may think you think it's all in their head. So you have to be very clear what the psychologist is going to do, that they're going to get them uh, coping with their symptoms, uh, not fixing their heads, which is the, um, uh, and one way to convert from the physical to the psychological is you gently explore. Um, you know, you have a lot of stress in your life and that may be making your symptoms worse. You may want to go and see. So the referral to a psychologist uh, shouldn't be done at the first visit. Uh, in fact, good counsellors and psychologists would say, don't refer these people at the first visit. Many of them will get better by the time they get there. But keep that for the, the patient who's not getting better. Next slide, David. Uh, dancing, we have to dance with the biomedical, the psychological and the social. It's a very interesting and challenging dance. And these patients you well remember all your life but I can appreciate you might want to wait a few years before you start taking up this form of dancing. In the meantime, you know, try tango, but um, dancing with your patients is probably something you want to leave till you've got a little bit more confidence in the uh, biomedical. Um, and I, I would encourage you to embrace the issue rather than avoid the issue. I see too many doctors avoiding the 
medically unexplained symptoms and they keep chasing with drugs and medication and more tests, um, the patient will definitely sense your discomfort. Next slide. Uh, referral, um, stop the um, multiple referrals and re-referrals. It's not a good diagnostic test in this situation. Um, the hospital will usually know they're not likely to find a new pathology. As I said before, they will, the investigations are discretionary, so they will do more because they think that's what you say. Um, and as Andrew alluded to, you'll find pathology that's not relevant. There's enormous costs and harms to all this, all this business. Next slide, please. Um, the, the referral to hospital, the tyranny of anonymity. Nobody owns it. Refer to others and others. I can't remember who quoted that. Next slide, please. And sometimes there's no end in sight. So you have to be willing to uh, sit with the patient and live with the uncertainty. Next slide, I think that's the end. Take home message, patient is suffering. Uh, maintain your relationship. See if the patient can link the uh, pain with the psychosocial. Consider coherent explanations. Real pathology can occur. I'll talk about a case later but try and avoid the multiple and re-referrals. Next slide, please. Um, doing investigations is discretionary. Try dancing with the patient. Cure is not always possible, but care is. Next slide. I think we're back, back to discussion. Right, thanks, Bruce. Um, I guess one thing that struck me from your description just then was the fact that even though it might not be a biomedical explanation, uh, patients still really value getting some kind of a shared understanding about what's going on. And I'm wondering uh, whether that's actually reflecting a, a natural human tendency to want to explain things. We need a, we need a narrative understanding in order to essentially uh, make ourselves feel better. What do you think? Well, well, you're absolutely right there, Dave. I think you hit the nail on the head. I, um, I'm always surprised how the short circuit explanation, because people understand a short circuit in their house or in their car, and they seem remarkably uh, happy with that. I think um, uh, leaving it up in the air, I think, is very, very hard. We're, we're, not, um, we're not designed to deal with uncertainty. Either it's a tiger or not a tiger, uh, a maybe is, is very painful for the human mind. Indeed. The, the other thing that, that uh, struck me, Bruce, was uh, the fact that um, these patients often um, feel like um, they're alone in dealing with this. And so having a, a clinician who's uh, understanding and is caring for them matters a lot. Uh, the other thing that can matter a lot is to feel that they aren't alone in another sense, um, because we can often tell our patients that um, what they're experiencing is not uncommon, that these things happen all the time. And if uh, I've, I think patients often find that reassuring to get the idea that there's a, a, a bit of normalization going on, that they are you know, experiencing something that others have done and indeed have uh, have gotten better from. And, and the, just the enormous desire for people to be seen, heard and understood. If you can remember those, that little mantra, um, you will not come unstuck in medicine, I don't think, but people definitely do come unstuck when they, when patients don't feel seen, heard or understood. Um, they, they can go into a rage and that's when they write to the Health and Disability Commissioner um. Right. Uh, we're about to move on to um, physician Tim. I'm wondering before we do that, whether Natalie or Andrew might have any comment. Um, not, not in particular. Um, thank, thanks for that, that talk though, Bruce. And I, I liked the point that you made about the um, solution often becoming the problem. 
and and it's when people are trying to find ways of fixing their symptoms that that actually gets in the way of like you said sort of expanding their life and leads to that constriction so i think that's a really good that, point to make. a direct quote from kirk strossel, strossel. <laughs> i'd also say bruce that when you guys as in a gps send people with vague abdominal pain to surgeons we don't usually find anything that you've missed so you know whether we're just offering it and they've waited three to four months in the public system to see us um so you know just i think being confident in what you're what you're dealing with is 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 good yes absolutely yeah and i guess when we refer them we we know you're probably not going to find anything and it's a bit of a it, it's a it's a very uncomfortable dance and as I say, it's often driven by the parents. In fact, when I do refer somebody, I will say, I'm not sure uh, this is needed, but the parents want it. So that the person at the other end can sort of get that message. So we're actually on the same page. Um, and they realize I'm not wanting more scans and scopes and things, unless they're deemed necessary. You know, there may be something I've missed. So, I mean, it's not unreasonable to do. But uh, I think if you say, if you that the, the good GP will put that in a um, what am I hoping to achieve? Well, I'm hoping to appease the parents. The other thing that um, might be worth mentioning there is the value of uh, of peer review and discussion. So instead of making a referral, um, you might find it useful to discuss with a colleague down the hall about a case that you're dealing with that might have you know, referral as an option. And I think getting, getting a degree of peer support is often helpful in these cases because they can be tricky. Absolutely. Well, we have a rule in our clinic. If a patient returns for a third visit for the same problem, you're obliged to discuss that with a colleague um, before doing anything with them. Because that's, when you look at the malpractice literature, that's when people get into trouble people keep coming back. Somebody who keeps coming back uh, may have something going on. Uh, it's certainly not being dealt with. Uh, it may be medically unexplained, but um, it's a, that's a good point, David. I think we should add that to the slide set somewhere. And this is actually quite reminiscent of uh, uh, Tim Cundy's earlier description of uh, pounding square pegs into round holes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that don't keep doing it. So let, let's move on and see what Tim has to say about uh, another case from uh, the world of internal medicine. I've unmuted myself, so I um, hope it can be heard. Um, so this is a case um, when I, I saw in my, one of my clinics. Um, uh, and I think it, it echoes a lot of the points that have been made and then in, also introduces an additional factor which we haven't really touched on yet. So this is um, the case of a 64-year-old woman brought to her GP by her daughter. Her daughter translates for her for the GP and she complains of body aches of two years duration. Um, GP does her best with um, trying to, there's questions we teach you to ask in medical school, but there's nothing really specific in sight, timing, precipitating or relieving factors. But on direct questioning, which is, uh, we always go to sooner or later, uh, the longer you've been practicing, the later you go to it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, she does say why well, she gets low back pain. So I was uh, interested to see that list of symptoms of uh, Keith, the Keith Petrie's paper that Natalie showed. Um, top of the list was low back pain and neck pain, 35%. Um, I can assure you from personal experience, uh, as your age goes up, that percentage goes up as well. Um, so low back pain is a pretty universal Common, uh, Bruce, everyone over the age of 50 will have some back pain at some point. So I don't x-ray the low back. <laughs> I'm just coming on to the next point. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, 
okay, I've got some back pain. I think, and again, possibly under pressure from uh, <clears throat> the uh, woman's family, um, the, uh, uh, an X-ray is taken, and this is reported to be anatomically normal, a bit of disc degeneration as most of us will have at that age. Um, but the radiologist commented that the the bones look a bit thin, the bone density appears a bit low. Um, I'm getting a message on the screen here. Anyway, I'm getting a message. All right, it's gone away now. Um, so, so this is an example of, of this cascading effect of uh, one investigation, which was, as Bruce has just pointed out, it's probably inappropriate, uh, leading to a second investigation. Um, so the bones look a bit thin, now let's go and get a bone density scan. And um, this uh, <clears throat> shows what we call osteopenia of, 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 the, of the spine. That means the, um, the bone density is, oh, in this case, is just on over, just more than one and a half standard deviations below a 20 year old. Um, there are many areas of life when you get to be 64 that aren't quite as good as when you're 20. Um, and this is one of them. But this is actually quite close to the average for her age, as you can see from this, this graph, which showing the bone density going down with age, and that's our patient here um, with the green dot. So, um, well, thin bones. Mm. Um, and also the GP <clears throat> requested a vitamin D level, which is uh, something we discourage as well, particularly during the winter time, because everyone's is a little bit low, um, and hers is, guess what, a little bit low. So um, we get then packed off to the bone clinic because we have medicines that can make bones stronger and reduce the risk of fracture. So all seems logical on the surface, <clears throat> but there's, what's going on here? What's missing from the story? Um, there's actually quite a lot missing from the story. So let's just deal with the medical stuff. Her, her, the medical history is unremarkable apart from mild hypertension on treatment. Uh, importantly, she's never had a fracture. So she comes from, um, my, my dog may be barking in a second, sorry. Um, she comes from Fujian province in southern China. And she was a school teacher and her husband was a magistrate. Uh, so they're people of some standing in their community. Uh, unfortunately, he died four years ago of cancer. And um, so after that, she moved to uh, Aotearoa to live with her daughter, who was trained in New Zealand, and so fluent in English, was an accountant and her son-in-law. So she moved about six months after her husband died. And what does she do now? She looks after their four-year-old son uh, while, while the parents work. So she speaks the Hokkien dialect from southern China and Mandarin, but uh, almost no English, although she's um, been here nearly four years. And she's unable to drive and, and get around that way. So um, there we go. Just go back, David. It's a little bit too premature on the slide. Sorry. Can you that one? Yeah, so I think the important things that struck me about this history um, is how how much she lost, what a, what a huge amount of loss. She lost her husband, obviously. She'd lost her standing in society. She lost um, her, the place she lived in, the ability to communicate with people around her. She was unable really to get out and meet new people because she's bound with childcare duties. And um, the thing that struck me about this is a, a huge amount of loss. And, and just to echo the point that Bruce made, her life had become very, very constrained. Um, and, but rather, I think Bruce was implying that, um, that the symptoms can cause the constraint. But here, I think maybe the constraint is con contributing to the symptoms. So yes, now, David, thank you. So, the point I was going to make about this is um, that 
<clears throat> somatizing disorders, if you like, or medically unexplained symptoms, or whatever you like to call them, are extremely common uh, amongst migrants and refugees. Um, and they, you know, we, we tend to think our way of expressing distress and attaching labels like depression and anxiety things is the right way to go. But different cultures have different ways of expressing uh, these, these issues, these concerns. And um, on the right there, there's the Chinese ideographs for depression, which is employed in medical settings, but it's not in popular usage. They don't, um, it, it's not, they don't have a sort of a concept of depression like we think we do. But in fact, it's depression, I think, is a word that we throw around quite willy-nilly. We, you know, is it a, an emotion? Is it a mood? Is it a, um, a transient illness? Is it a major psychotic illness? We tend to use the word depression for a lot of those things. Um, so I think just one of the points I wanted to make with this case is, is particularly when you're dealing with people from different cultures, or recent migrants, one of the things I always do is take a, a migration history. It's, it's really interesting. Um, it's relevant to lots of other things besides um, uh, medically unexplained symptoms. So where did you come from? How long have you been here? Um, you know, who, who have you got here? What languages do you speak? And so on. Uh, I think they're really important um, things to find out about people. It can help you understand the situation that they're in. The next slide, I think that might be it. Oh, well, not quite. So, going back to the beginning, I think so. There's a woman with possibly a bit of low back pain, um, ended up in an osteoporosis clinic with the request from her general practitioner that we give her some very potent medicine, not without side effects, uh, to fix the low bone density. A number of quick points. Uh, thin bones do not cause bone pain. Um, thin bones cause fractures. Of course, if you get a fracture, you have bone pain. But bone, thin bones themselves uh, don't cause fracture. And then when we're thinking about whether we are going to treat um, somebody like this for thin bones, we, we take into, try to take into account fracture risks. So in the same way that cardiologists, you know, with their we look at a lot of different risk factors, your previous heart attack, your blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, uh, smoking, hypertension, so on, to decide what your future risk of heart attack is going to be. We base treatment around the risk. Um, we can got a similar devices for assessing risk in osteoporosis, particularly taking into account uh, previous fracture bone density, but a number of other factors. And when we do plug her data in, then we get a risk of any fracture in the next 10 years is less than 4%, and the risk of a hip fracture is less than 1%. So her chances of benefiting from any treatment we can throw at her are very low. So the answer is, should treatment be offered? No. Uh, but should we think a little bit more about the stories of people with these common complaints? Uh, I'd say the answer is yes. I think that's my last slide, David. Isn't it? <coughs> that's the dog. <laughs> okay. So, great, great case, uh, Tim. I think it really illustrates the issue we touched on before of uh, of diagnostic momentum. That once uh, investigations are started, uh, one has to. Uh, consciously often uh, call a stop to them because they tend to um, perpetuate in themselves. And so whose job is it then? Um, I mean, it, it sounds to me like uh, her GP in this case uh, fell prey to the temptation to lead on from uh, one uh, investigation to the next to a uh, obvious treatment which on reflection was not in fact indicated so um, you've isolated um, you know two of the perils in assessing 
people such as this. Um, and it's, uh, it's very instructive to uh, uh, take stock of what the, uh, the harms and benefits are of any of those um, steps toward diagnosis and treatment. Any further points about that case? Um, th right. Thanks, Tim. You're talking, but you're muted. Did you want to say something? Um, I'm, un I'm unmuted now. I think in this particular case that the, the general practitioner came under pressure from the family to find something and do something. And, um, Hence the the uh, the moment the the train got started. Right. So it, it does it does require a, a deliberate um, halt to be called to the uh, uh, progression of that train. Um, yeah. Very very instructive case. Um, I think the uh, um, the audience is perhaps um, going to be encouraged to uh, have a stretch and, and a break before resuming the, the next phase of our discussion, which is going to briefly survey uh, some issues in the doctor-patient relationship and uh, one more uh, clinical scenario that um, uh, Bruce will present shortly. Uh, before we Get to that. Is there anything uh, further that anyone would like to comment upon? Okay, so uh, just finishing off uh, today's presentation um, about uh, problems in the doctor patient relationship. And you'll recall that uh, much of today's message was around how the biomedical model doesn't really equip us to deal effectively with uh, medically unexplained symptoms. It also fails to help us deal with uh, other common problems in the doctor-patient relationship. And here are a few listed, um, some of them uh, directly relevant to those uh, challenging clinical presentations that we discussed earlier. Um, I would commend uh, to you this chapter in a book that's freely available uh, from the Medical Council. Um, it's called Cole's Medical Practice in New Zealand, but um, one of the chapters here, um, chapter three, deals specifically uh, with these issues, and it's um, a very concise uh, and easy and informative read, so um, strongly recommended about all these uh, remaining issues that we're going to touch on just now. Um, all sorts of things affect the doctor-patient relationship and indeed here are a few key ones. Um, very important as Bruce will have alluded to uh, that one's communication is uh, aligned in a way uh, to the satisfaction of both parties. It's very, very useful to pursue what we call a, a shared narrative about what's going on and what needs to happen. Uh, uh, my little slide from my five years working in the UK, I was in Wales, and you can see the importance of having an understanding between Welsh speakers and English speakers, really, really crucial. Um, the question that we come back to over and over again is how informed should our patients be? This is a tricky one because you can overdo it and you can also underdo it. So it's a little bit like investigations or treatments that you want to hit the sweet spot in the middle. And there are certainly perils of uh, being at either extreme. Um, and what we actually say to people um, is also uh, a controversial area and how much we feel obliged to inform them. And of course, they're not all the same. Uh, they have different degrees of interest and literacy, etc. So it does have to be calibrated and it is uh, reassuring, I suppose, that um, this is yet another area where 
we are unlikely to be replaced by robots. Uh, one thing that we encounter quite often in clinical practice is patients who uh, perhaps want more than they need and how to handle them is quite tricky. We've just heard from, uh, uh, well, all, all the presenters really about when patients are, are asking for things or others are asking on their behalf for things that are more likely to cause harm than benefit. And so managing this is a recurrent but important challenge in clinical practice. Um, along with that is this notion of disease conviction. And there's a, a, an interesting phenomenon when it spills into uh, politics. People have very strong views about um, uh, what's an illness and what isn't and whether they've got it or whether they don't. And you can see here a couple of examples of how this is spilled over in a rather unfortunate and destructive way into actually uh, government policy uh, regarding uh, research. So just a, a little bit of a sideshow, but quite relevant, I think, to the general area. Um, Bruce has another case here that uh, I think we are going to, in the interest of time, just skip over but I would encourage um, the students to come back to this and just uh, consider yet another example of how doctor-patient communication can be crucial to uh, negotiating this minefield. Um, so please, please do come back to this uh, uh, in your own time and consider uh, indeed what it was that went wrong in this case and how it might have been handled differently. Um, obviously, uh, there are some additional examples from your own experience, I'm sure by now in, in year five, where you will have encountered things of a, uh, a miscommunication between doctor and patient that it doesn't always end pleasantly. Useful to keep an eye on that. Um, the other thing that happens in doctor-patient relationships is an inappropriate degree of attachment. Um, so you can have too little attachment, you can also have too much, and you can have the wrong sort. And there's all sorts of problems that can happen if you're not careful. And it's quite important to keep an eye on this and indeed uh, keep your colleagues involved uh, as is often useful with uh, peer support and having that colleague just down the hall when you're dealing with the tricky situation. Uh, John Ellard, um, who's referred to in the bottom there, wrote this wonderful book called The Anatomy of Mirages, which amongst other things, uh, considers how to keep yourself safe uh, medical legally when dealing with difficult patients. Uh, finally, just to wrap it up from today, we've considered a whole range of topics within the domain of functional illness or illness without disease and also some uh, associated difficulties in the doctor-patient relationship. Um, the ways that um, getting this wrong can uh, rebound on us, of course, uh, is with regard to problems uh, right across the board in the clinical process from investigation through diagnosis and treatment and all the harms, whether medical or surgical or other, that can obtain if people uh, get more treatment than they need. Um, obviously, keeping your communication skills um, uh, up to date and sharp is useful. And there's another uh, course series of um, ways to do that, including uh, peer support and feedback. Um, obviously, uh, all, all the presenters today have emphasized the a crucial role of a good history and how we can keep ourselves um, out of trouble by listening carefully to the patient and taking all available information into account and getting to a formulation. Uh, management, of course, is a many splendored thing and does rely, apart from uh, anything else, on building an alliance with the patient and often with the family and being able to strike the right balance uh, in terms of the right amount of investigations, the right amount of information, and the appropriate degree of negotiated treatment. Um, there's 
often as Bruce uh, indicated so clearly, a lot of value in being able to uh, acknowledge concerns and anxieties, but also provide appropriate reassurance to people. And I think um, uh, Andrew also was uh, able to describe a, a, a common scenario where the parents can be uh, appropriately informed and reassured. Um, obviously, we need to be careful about um, saying the, uh, the right things and avoid saying the wrong things. Uh, most of the complaints that go to the council or to HDC are indeed around communication rather than anything uh, technical or knowledge-based. So really getting communication uh, as a priority is, uh, is well worth it for your uh, professional well-being. Um, when it comes to management, I guess the problem list that Natalie refers to is, is quite Im important, as well as being realistic in what sort of goals, which might not include uh, complete relief of symptoms, might often uh, involve instead uh, managing symptoms and uh, minimizing impairment uh, associated with that. So there's all kinds of strategies to do that. Here's just a few um, that we've uh, touched on, many of them uh, uh, rather different from a conventional biomedical approach, but often enhanced by the judicious application of biomedicine in concert with these other approaches. Um, you'll see that uh, uh, other experiences pop up during year five um, in general practice, psychiatry, and other disciplines to help you with these challenges. And just remember that um, uh, we sometimes find ourselves uh, carrying more of the burden than our colleagues do, but uh, we're not making any disciplinary attributions here. Anyway, uh, thanks all for your attention and just let the other presenters offer any final comment that they may wish to make before we close. Uh, Bruce here, no comments from me, David. Uh, that was an excellent session, thank you. Yep, I don't have anything to add either. So thanks for covering those last parts, David. Great, Andrew? Yeah, I just think it's very important that those who are listening understand this. These are not easy cases necessarily. Um, the problem is they do make up a very large percentage of the patients that we see either in general practice or specialist care. And uh, we need to be aware, we need to be judicious with how we investigate and treat these people. And we need to be very aware about communication. Um, but bear in mind, these are difficult problems potentially and as Bruce says maybe in 100 years we'll know exactly what's going on but until then we've just got to use all the skills that we we have it, it's it's challenging that's all thanks David great thank you all and um, we'll uh, le leave you with a uh, a thought about Rene Descartes who uh, who saw the the mind and the body as being uh, completely distinct I think we know now that that is um, one thing that Descartes got wrong and we've uh, taken now 300 years to put it right. But um, anyway, thanks uh, everyone for your patience and uh, we'll sign off from there.